Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our second conversation as part of the Trinity Law School's Spring Series tonight, titled Assessing the Future of Irish Defamation Law. Uh, my name is Gareth Crowe. I'm an Associate Director with uh, Trinity uh, Development and Alumni, TDA. Our talk this evening will last around 35 minutes. Uh, there'll be Q&A from, from you all, I hope, following that. And we're aiming to finish up at about 7 p.m. Irish time. We really encourage you to submit questions you have for our speakers throughout the webinar by using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen if you're viewing on Zoom. We are using Zoom generated automatic subtitles. To turn these subtitles on or off, you can click at the bottom of the screen at the closed captions and click show or hide subtitles. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. If you are watching on Zoom, you will get a link to the recording after the webinar. The, now I'd like to introduce you and hand you over to this evening's host and our MC, Professor Yvonne Scannell. Professor Scannell is an Emeritus Professor in the School of Law here at Trinity College. She's one of Europe's foremost experts on environmental and planning law and is a former judge of the European Nuclear Energy Tribunal at the OCED in Paris. Professor Scannell. Good evening, alumni and friends. I wave to you and say hello. Now, this evening, we're going to talk about defamation law, and we have three of the leading Irish experts in this area talking to each other on this important topic. Our first speaker is Kenan Furlong, who is a partner in Dell Goodbody, which is a leading Irish law firm. And he works in the white collar group and corporate reputation team. He's a particular expertise in internet law and defamation, and he has lectured in Trinity and written uh, articles on the topic. We also have this evening Owen McCullough, senior counsel, who is a leading senior, senior counsel practicing in the area of defamation law, although he does other areas of law as well. And Owen has appeared in most of the leading cases that you read about in the paper dealing with defamation. He's co-author with Neville on, of the law and practice relating to defamation. And last but not least is Professor Neville Cox, who's a professor in our law school still. He was the Dean of Students. He specializes in uh, defamation law as well, but he also teaches and writes on sports law, on um, in, um, internet law, and in all sorts of other areas of law, and he's written many articles and books, as most academics in Trinity are required to do. So without further ado, I will open our proceedings this evening, and we ask uh, our panel, what do you think are the major reforms needed in the area of defamation law? So could... So... Um... Thanks very much, Yvonne. I, I think probably the most helpful thing for me would be to uh, to hand over to the practitioners. So maybe uh, Keenan, I could ask you if, if there was one area of defamation law that you felt had to be reformed, uh, or if there was one reform, what for you? What would it be? Yeah. Thanks, Neville, and, and thanks to everyone for for involving me in, the, in this evening's seminar. The one area for me that is most ripe for reform, I guess, would be the role of the jury. And I do appreciate that the role a jury plays in a defamation case is a, is a complex issue. There are arguments for and against. But when you're considering the issue, I, I often like to just look at the, the raw data in the first instance. And when I'm talking about raw data, I mean the data about appeals from jury awards in defamation cases. And just doing a bit of prep for this evening's session, you know, I came across seven reported cases where appellate courts have found the damages awarded by juries were materially excessive, so successful appeals. I came across one reported case where an appellate court endorsed the amount awarded by a jury, and I couldn't find any case where an appellate court had found that the damages awarded by a jury were too low. And that data isn't necessarily conclusive of anything, but to me it's suggestive of the fact that juries frequently award too much, never award too little and sometimes get it spot on. And for me, that's a worrying kind of um, initial data point in respect of the role of juries in defamation cases. Moving on from that then very briefly as regards other arguments why I feel that um, juries should be removed entirely from defamation cases is because 
for me, it's not just the frequency that these errors are occurring, it's the nature of the errors, Neville. So, you know, if you look at some of the cases and Owen has been involved in, in a lot of them, you know, some of the awards that have been made have been hugely reduced. If you take, let's say the Ken Mare case, which is probably the best example, a 97% reduction, the Higgins case, which I was involved in, an 80% reduction. So when they make mistakes, it can go very, very badly wrong. And in the Higgins case last year that I referenced a moment ago, that was of particular concern to me because in that case, the jury was given expert guidance for the first time, I believe, in terms of the different factors that should be taken into account in how much damages should be awarded, um, uh, defamation awards in various cases, defamation case, uh, sorry, jury award, or damages awards in non-defamation cases, so personal injury awards as well. So expert guidance by the judge, expert submissions by two leading senior counsel of similar caliber to Owen, and yet they still, in the view of the Court of Appeal, awarded the plaintiff five times what you know, he, he deserved to get or, or, or should have got. And that for me was, was something of a concern and, and, and sparked me to, to write an article about the issue. And then just finally, that um, my experience of juries is that the, the cases take so much longer when they're before a jury as compared to being before a judge. That case I just referenced took seven days, would have been done in two, I'd say, before a judge, maybe three. Um, but certainly not seven. And that I think is the, the unspoken factor sometimes about juries that, that, that you don't hear so much about in that the costs associated with a jury trial contribute to me, uh, in my view, to settlement inflation and to inflating the value of these cases. So just to wrap up, I'm not anti-jury. I'm not saying that they can't do their current job. I acknowledge and I appreciate that sometimes they do it very effectively. I also know that it's not an easy role and that the people who who find themselves performing that service are performing a valuable public service. So, you know, I want to I want to acknowledge that, and I think it's important. What I'm saying isn't that they can't do it. What I'm saying is I believe that judges can do it as well, if not better, and also a lot faster. Um, and for those reasons, I think that if judges were hearing defamation cases in their entirety, that would be better both for the plaintiff, for the defendant, and for broader society. Lawyers like ourselves might might lose a few quid in, in in the process, obviously, but I don't think there'd be too many people crying for our sake. So that's my view on the on the first major reform, abolition of the juries in, in defamation cases. Can, can I just can I come back to you on one point though? So if you take, um, I think it was Judge McKechnie's judgment in the Supreme Court in in the McDonough case. I mean, he effectively says, okay, so I'm kind of now misinterpreting what he says, but he, he more or less says, look, how do we know that an appeal court judge is right and a jury is wrong? So you, you, even if even if we say that that, jury, that uh, appeal court judges have overturned jury awards as excessive, how do we know they're right and, and the, the, the jury is wrong? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because, you know, I guess it's one of the most difficult things to value is the value of someone's reputation. But I think when you consider and compare the kind of awards that are made in serious personal injuries cases, and obviously we're talking about capping personal injury awards now, um, with the awards that are being made in, in, in some of the defamation awards, it's just self-evident that it must be wrong. So if you take the Ken Mayer case, and I know that's the most extreme example and perhaps the easiest one to refer to, but the idea that that plaintiff in that case would be awarded 10 million euro in damages and someone who suffered catastrophic personal injuries might get half a million, um, uh, just doesn't sit right with me. So. I think that's your evidence. I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relativity exercise. But in saying all that, I do acknowledge that it's a hugely subjective task. And I also acknowledge that judges will occasionally get it wrong as well. Um, I would argue that they will perhaps get it, get it wrong a little less frequently and uh, by a smaller margin. Yeah. Oh, and what's, your, what's your view? Just, would you like to give up the idea of practicing in front of juries in defamation cases? Um, well, I mean, as Keenan says, uh, there are arguments in favour of retaining juries, but 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 I think they're serious arguments. Um, juries, um, it, it's not just that they promote equality before the law, although they do. It's not just that the involvement of people in a jury promotes understanding on the part of people of the verdict that's reached, but it's that juries are good at the job, what they're primarily good at is assessing whether words are defamatory or not. That's something that's entrusted to ordinary people because it is something that ordinary people are good at. So I think there are genuinely serious arguments. All the arguments that you hear for the jury abolition 
um, are really similar to the ones that Keenan just set out there to do with the size of awards, and perhaps even more especially with the, un with the unpredictability of awards. And, and I sort of agree with that, but I think that it leads to a more subtle question. Do you abolish juries for all purposes? Or do you just abolish them or in some way alter the way in which they approach simply the question of damages? And you could take an example of uh, the Australian jurisdictions in most of which they've retained juries for all questions save qualified privilege and damages. But juries still decide questions of libel and no libel. And I, I think that might be a suitable halfway house. As to Keenan's other point, Juries take longer and they're more expensive. That's true at one level, um, but it's partly down to the fact that uh, judges are slow at the way in which they deal with juries. But, but there are speed advantages with juries too. Um, certainly in practical terms, when you're before a jury, you have to simplify a case. You have to leave aside the complex points. You have to make the thing clear. And there is also the advantage of an immediate verdict. Um, you know, Every practitioner has had the disadvantage of hearing a case quickly and then sitting around waiting for a judgment for a year. So I think there are serious advantages and I don't know what the government's going to do. I think it probably will alter the jury system to some degree, but I don't think that a very good case has ever been made for abolishing juries in their entirety. What about the, um, excuse me, what the, 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 um, the UK experience though, since 2013 yeah. suggestion that maybe you know, the difficult questions of honest opinion and fair comment and qualified privilege, like the, the technical stuff can be dealt with more effectively. You don't need pre-trial applications. It can just be done in the course of a trial by a judge. Well, it's certainly the view they've taken in England, as you say, since 2013, they are for all practical purposes um, abolished in England. And, and that is on the basis of a perception, both in parliament and the part of the judges, that juries aren't good at complex questions. I have to say, I'm not sure I agree with that. I think a well-instructed jury can understand most things pretty well. Um, it's a judge's job to make it clear. So I, I, I'm not, not convinced of it, I have to say. Um, and do you think, I mean, do you, when we're looking down the tracks of reform, which is due to happen, yeah. we're told any day now, we've been told that for, for, for a number of years. Um, do you think that they will abolish juries? from defamation cases, it'd be a fairly radical reform, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, um, just before we started this, uh, Keenan was making the point that many politicians are jury plaintiffs or defamation plaintiffs. So I'm not sure that politicians are as enthusiastic about defamation reform as newspapers are, you know. Um, mm. But nevertheless, I do think they will interfere with it, yes. And I, I wouldn't be surprised, I have to say, if they do something or take something like the approach I've just been suggesting might be thought of which is to alter the way in which juries address defamation actions, but not abolish them entirely. And beyond jury abolition, or what happens to the jury? Um, what if you had one kind of prize reform that you'd like to see happening in defamation cases or in defamation law, what, what would it be? Well, I think the, the other big thing that is um, on the agenda at the moment is the question of whether there should be an introduction of some sort of serious harm test. Um, akin Which again to what, has happened in England since again like, to what they have in, in, in England exactly yeah and uh, I mean that's a very interesting question because there are traces in Ireland of Ireland being seen as a, a good place to come to uh, to run a defamation action I, I was doing one last week um, for an American uh, news site uh, that uh, has maybe two million people who commonly read the article or read this article of whom there's about 100 in Ireland. Plaintiff is American. There's almost nobody who read it here, as I said. No Irish reputation. Nevertheless, the plaintiff is here because this is a good place to sue and because you don't have the sort of tests that you have to meet in the States. And now in England, uh, equally, he wouldn't get his action on. So that, that, that I think, is probably um, as big an item on the agenda. And I certainly wouldn't be surprised if that was introduced in the next round of reforms. I mean, Keenan, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, on I was discussing with colleagues earlier on. I mean, there's there's two kinds of defamation. I think the serious harm threshold would pretty much eliminate, if not overnight, then gradually. Um, one is what I describe as retail defamation, which is where I cut my teeth 
uh, many moons ago, which is, you know, shock alarms go off and people interpret that as being accused of theft or the, the interaction that happens around the, them walking out of the shop and, and being asked to return their bag or something. There was quite a spate of them for, for a long time. Obviously, I, I would anticipate they wouldn't pass a serious harm threshold test given the very limited sphere of publication. And also, I think the kind of case that, that you mentioned, I read about it in the newspapers, um, Owen, so I won't con uh, comment on it in, in any detail other than to say that I, I think that if there was a serious harm threshold introduced, that um, that would reduce uh, libel tourism uh, and make Ireland perhaps seem a, 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 less, uh, a less attractive destination for it. So in my view, if the introduction of a serious harm threshold was to have the effect of eliminating or, or reducing both those kinds of cases, then I must say, I don't think that would be a bad thing um, in the greater scheme of things. Um, and I'd like to think that defamation law might be perhaps reserved for, for other kinds of more important uh, cases or cases more closely connected with Ireland. So I would be in favour of a serious harm threshold, but I do acknowledge as well that there are counter arguments and that, you know, um, it does mean in effect that some people who have been defamed and who perhaps feel that the issue, it, it perhaps if not super serious, then is at least something that deserves recompense. I, I do understand that they would they would fall victim of that kind of a, that kind of reform, but on balance, I, I think I would be in favour of it. it. Might be a constitutional issue, now. I don't know if you. Yeah. Yeah, I I wondered about this as to whether, the, well, I, I had two questions which I wondered about the, the serious harm threshold. First of all, I wondered whether it was operable if you continued to have a jury in place. In other words, would it be a jury question as to whether there was a serious harm? Uh, in which case, I, I think there could be all sorts of difficulties um, in the jury trying to comprehend what's meant by serious harm. Um, I also, I mean, I, like Ireland's unusual in the sense of, it's the, the, pretty much the only Western European jurisdiction that has an express constitutional right to a good name and suggests to some extent that what happens in England, the United States, um, in other jurisdictions, which perhaps are more disposed to protecting freedom of expression, um, should be taken a little bit cautiously insofar as they apply in Ireland because of this express uh, constitutional requirement to, to protect good name. And it's arguable that, you know, in terms of assessing what is serious harm or what, how substantial harm in terms of a threshold, that there'd be a sort of vision which would be objective, saying, look, objectively, I wouldn't consider this serious because it doesn't apply to me. And I, I thought that the point that you made, Owen, about the real value of the jury being that it gives a community standard to something which fundamentally needs a community standard, whether something can lower you in the reputation of the community. Um, I thought that was really important because it seems to me that people will people can be deeply hurt by, by stories about themselves or rumors about themselves, which I might say, ah, Jesus, just put up with it, it's trivial or whatever, but just might really get in on them and might, from the purposes of, of their position in the community, might be devastating. Um, and I do wonder how the serious harm threshold would, would, would operate. Would it be a sort of the objectivization by reference to the standards of, for instance, a judge in a preliminary application say, well, I wouldn't care about this, so yeah. why would it matter? But I don't know, is, is that a matter of concern, Owen? Well, yeah, you're certainly right to say that it's hard to see how it marries with, um, with the jury's role. So I think if it was to be introduced, it would almost certainly have to be some sort of preliminary test run by judges. Um, but uh, I'm not sure equally that it would abolish those shoplifting cases that Keenan was talking about. I mean, serious enough in context, isn't it? If somebody accuses you of shoplifting in a community, that can be a non-trivial thing, I think. I think the sort of case that it might exclude are the sort of cases where there's a big publication, but a very small circulation in Ireland and where in context, it's um, not serious harm when you see it as a component of the whole harm. Yeah, I hear you. Oh, I guess... The, the, the allegation that you've perhaps stolen something or done something like that in a, in a retail context is serious on one level, but I wonder would it fail the test just on the basis that the very limited sphere of publication and, and you know, okay, a, a serious thing has been said about you, but only in front of a handful of people or something like that. And therefore, 
you know, it can't pass that serious harm threshold. That that was the thinking on it. But even if if they survived, and and perhaps some of the libel tourists had a look at it and said, well, you know, if that's a hurdle I have to clear in Ireland, then maybe maybe I might look uh, I might look elsewhere. Um, that that could also be a benefit, I guess. Is is that the root of libel tourism, Keenan? Do you think? I mean, because I've wondered about this as to as to why plaintiffs from abroad would, would consider, I mean, I can understand why they would consider, especially if they're public figures, would consider America pretty much an impossible jurisdiction to sue in. But what makes Dublin so attractive as, as a kind of a place for litigation? Yeah, I, I think there's probably a few factors and it depends on the plaintiff. But I think for plaintiffs with extensive means who aren't necessarily that concerned about getting a big damages award, I think if they want to win, they might think that a jury is a good place to be fighting your case, particularly if it's a marginal case. There's a perception, valid or not, that juries are, are pro plaintive or, um, you know, that, that they, uh, even in terms of liability, not just damages. Um, and then obviously, if you're someone who is looking to get actual, um, to, get, um, to get money out of it, then um, there might be a perception that you might actually do better from an Irish jury you might get more damages for an Irish jury, even if you're not based in Ireland or, or the person you're suing isn't domiciled in Ireland. So you can only get the damages that will be awarded by an Irish jury. You might even still do better coming over here. So I, I think the, the jury actually is a significant factor in the libel tourism issue as well. Not suggesting it's the only one, but I would say it's uppermost in the thoughts of some of the libel tourists for that description who, who've been before the courts recently. That's probably true. I mean, it, it, it feels like an American jury award um, simply because it is a jury and it's a common law system which feels like something akin to what's being done in the States. So it's a, a, of greater value, I think, in countries of a common law, with countries with a common law background. On that basis, I mean, I suppose, is that a, is that a reason actually, Owen, why why it would be appropriate to bring in, bring in the two sort of major reforms of the UK since 2013, which is effective abolition of the jury and the substantial harm or serious harm threshold in the sense that it, it would discourage this kind of libel tourism. It seems to me that, you know, one of the reasons why Ireland must be so attractive post 2013 is because it's more attractive for a plaintiff than London at this stage. Yes, well, um... If you introduce a serious harm test, you would, I think, deal with libel tourism. I don't think you need to affect, I don't think you need to alter the jury system in order to achieve that effect. Um, there's not much else I think you can do. We don't really have control over jurisdiction in defamation actions anymore, but that's all operated at a European level. So uh, if you want to discourage libel tourism, insofar as it's a big problem, and it's not a huge problem, you no. have to say, but insofar as it is a problem, well, then I think the introduction of some form of serious harm test or some form of substantial publication in Ireland test would overcome that. Um, I, I, I don't think that you need to go further. Neville, there's, there's one other reform that I'd just be interested in, 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 in your views and Owen's on, and it's, it's kind of the other side of the scale, really. Um, and it's this, if, if one of you was to defame me on, on this evening's call and I issued proceedings tomorrow, uh, based on a conversation I had with the central office recently, it was six years before my case is heard. Now, I, I do appreciate that um, COVID is obviously a huge exacerbating factor and, and Owen and I were discussing before we began that there's no juries sitting at the moment for defamation cases. But even pre-COVID, the delays were pretty significant. The last case I had, the defamation jury list, it got on, I think, at the fourth time of asking. Um, so very significant delays. And I think if you're talking about a six year delay, which seems to be where we're now at, that to me sounds a bit like justice delayed, being justice denied. So I'm just wondering, I'd be interested in your views and Owen's views on, on whether you feel that, you know, perhaps as pressing a reform, if not more pressing, would be looking at our system, speeding it up, whether it's more judges, case management, um, whatever it may be. So interested in your views on that. Yeah, I think that's the simplest thing in the world. I mean, they're, they're, they're delays in jury actions aren't caused by the existence of juries. They're caused by the fact that only one judge has been allocated to hear Dublin jury actions for the past seven or eight years with one or two exceptions in one or two terms. And the consequence of that is that if one action gets on, well, then nothing else gets on for the entire of the jury term, which is either three weeks or four weeks in each term. 
But the answer to that is simple. Just appoint a second, a second judge to every second term and you'd get, get through the backlog pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Actually, funny enough, so I was thinking, you know, in terms of what are the, the big picture reforms that, uh, or the, the reforms that I'd like to see a defamation law, and there are some just on, on the face of, of the, the Defamation Act, which a bit of it, which I think could be tidied and, and should be tidied. But I think some, some expediting of the processes is really yeah. necessary, whether it be through uh, enhanced case management, and the Supreme Court has spoken about that relatively recently in defamation cases, or more judges, absolutely more judges hearing um, uh, attached to the jury list and so on. Because, you know, one of the things that has always struck me as really significant is that in uh, actions to strike out for delay or want to prosecution, the courts have consistently said, well, look, if someone's had a hit to their good name, they should be expected to want to get this on quickly. Mm -hmm. The statute of limitations has reduced the time period for issuing uh, proceedings for defamation. So that being the case, if there is this idea that there is an obligation to move things on quickly because the harm to your reputation is something which needs to be dealt with quickly, then it's, a, then it's an outrage if cases are taking sure. the time to get on, you know? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, Sorry, I'm gone yet. No, I was just going to um, raise another suggestion that has, um, for practical purposes in England, awards are capped and they're statutorily capped in Australia. That's an alternative to uh, to rendering, you know, fundamental alterations to the jury system. Don't know if you have thought about that one, Keenan or Neville. I don't like it, um, Owen. I have thought about it, and and you know. One of the reasons I don't like it is I often think about the Leach case, um, and I appreciate that was an award that was reduced by a reasonable amount on, on appeal to the Supreme Court. But let's say there was a cap in operation. You know, um, I wonder, would that have adversely affected someone in, in, in her situation, you know, who really was very severely detrimentally affected by the defamatory comments? Um, so I, I don't really like the idea of a cap because I guess I feel that you know, um, there should be the flexibility to award people what it is they deserve at the upper end. I'm not as concerned as, you, you know, from what I said earlier about what I would regard as pretty trivial defamation by comparison, but someone whose life is effectively being ruined. Um, uh, I don't like the idea, and it's maybe it's just a, an instinct thing. I don't like the mm. idea that there was, would be some cap that, um, that, that somehow could potentially half their award. I know you can make that argument in other areas like personal injuries as well, perhaps, but... Um, to a certain extent, but I don't like it for that reason. If there is an argument, I, okay, I'm going to throw out the kind of controversial point, which is contrary to what you know we're hearing a lot of in, in terms of damage awards being excessive in defamation cases. There's the argument that that damages look in any situation where someone suffered injury. Money is a fairly crass form of remedy, effectively saying you've had an awful time, well, here's some money that can make you feel better. And it, it, it's crass in defamation cases as well. You, you know, you've lost your reputation, here's some money. But to some extent, I find damage awards in defamation cases more comprehensible, in fact, even than in personal injury actions in, in terms of general damages rather than specials. Um, because it seems to me that they're effectively part vindicating part punitive and part expressing a statement that you have been wronged and just kind of clarifying the matter. Uh, and to some, to, that's why I find it difficult to rationalize uh, the argument that damages and defamation cases are excessive because they are out of line with personal injury damages. Because it seems to me that, albeit that they're called compensation in both cases, they serve completely different purposes. Um, and I, I would tend to agree with Keenan, like, I tend to agree with Keenan that a cap is, especially if you retain a jury and say, look, this is a factual evaluation from the community as to what this case is worth. A cap is a fairly blunt way of saying, we're going to sort of allow within this frame of award, allow all these different concerns of vindication and punishment and deterrence and so on to be, to be located. Um, but, and possibly it is necessary if if awards are considered to be excessive. Like, Owen, what's your view on this? Do you think there should be a cap on damage awards? No, I don't. Um, I, I think the real, the real difficulty with awards is not that they're 
too big to be honest, is that they're too unpredictable. And uh, that encourages people to proceed to trial because they think that they'll give it a go. And that, I think, is one of the things that prolongs jury actions, because even more than most actions, they're pushed to the last moment. So some system of advising juries of what a fair reward is, is uh, would, I think, overcome a lot of the problems. The difficulty that judges have in doing that is that they should be able to look at appellate awards as being the source of what you can tell a jury is a fair award. And in turn, the difficulty in that regard is that appellate awards vary from 1.25 million to uh, Monica Leach all the way down to uh, an amount of 250,000 pounds being excessive in Dennis O'Brien's case. So it's hard to get an appellate fix. But if we could all agree that a jury could be told that 400,000 was a very big award, well, then I think it solved most of the problems immediately. A jury would just measure everything down from that. You could tell them that an award can be bigger than that, and they could be at liberty to do that. But you'd introduce that element of consistency that is the thing that's lacking at the moment. Yeah, I mean, for what, what it's worth, I mean, it, it is only one case, and there's a danger in relying on, on only one case. But, you know, I, I was in court when, when the judge directed the jury on, on the Higgins matter, and he, he did speak about personal injury awards, put flesh on the bones of them. Both counsels spoke about various awards. The Leach one was mentioned. A, a number of the leading cases we're all familiar with, the, the, the ones, you know, the, the, the appellate cases, as it were, so the, the one that can be relied on, all mentioned the, ju the judge was praised by the Court of Appeal in terms of how he, he presented the issue to the jury. And as I said earlier, two, two really top barristers outlining all the pros and cons. In my view, they had enough information to make I, I, they had as much information as could be provided, I feel, to make a reasonable decision. And yet they awarded the man five times as much as the Court of Appeal felt that the case was worth. So that for me was a real a real concern about this idea of maybe giving additional guidance. Um, I, I do take Owen's point. I think the best argument for retaining juries is when it comes to deciding if something is defamatory or not, then that community standard, you know, what better way to measure that by having uh, 12 members of the community um, I do think that's a that's a, a, a cogent, powerful argument. I just think it's outweighed by the the other arguments. I must say, but um, but I was concerned by the Higgins case in that regard. Oh, and just the, 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 the yeah. guidance they got, and they still went so wrong, left me wondering about whether guidance is the solution and whether it's better just to get rid of them. Yeah, you know, people have often pointed out that the same arguments apply in principle to um, to crime as they apply uh, in defamation. And if one's in favor of the abolition of juries in defamation, it's hard to see why those arguments don't apply over to crime. If, on the other hand, you took the power of awarding damages out of the hands of a jury in the same way as sentencing isn't in the hands of a jury in crime, well, then I think a lot of the criticism will be disarmed. I mean, you never, never hear anybody criticize a jury decision in crime. You hear lots of people criticize what the judge gave by way of sentence. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Could, could, could I ask one other question just in terms of, of reform or just one topic in terms of reform and then we might move to the sort of Q&A, which is this. So when the Defamation Act came in in 2009, before that, there was a very specific publication landscape. The internet was in relative infancy in terms of popular publications thereon. Um, but since then, there's been this sort of explosion of social media. It's the most common way in which uh, particular demographics uh, um, will communicate. And it's also the first time in human history that someone can, at the click of a button, reach the world with a comment that hasn't been edited by, by anyone else. And I just wonder, do you think defamation law, Irish defamation law, should make specific provision for social media publication or internet publication, rather than just saying, Asher, it's just another form of publication. It's the old constitutional balance between freedom of expression and good name being played out. We'll just take things by analogy with existing death world. We'll just apply um, existing defamation law to this new situation. Or is it something which is just so different, so unique that it requires specific treatment? Yes, it is completely different, I agree. And um, it's certainly, if we can think of a system, requires specific treatment. And I don't have that system. 
What I am convinced about, though, in the interim is that we shouldn't do any special favors for Internet publishers. And one of the most remarkable things of the current system is notwithstanding the, um, the, the fact that you can say almost what you like online and the fact that that reaches far more people than newspapers ever did in a far more uncontrolled way, that we give special favors to Internet publishers. So the e-commerce regulation sets up, set up special defenses for them. We have arguments about whether they're publishers at all. And for my part, I don't follow that. I think that at the very least, they ought to be subject to the same rules as everybody else. So that if Facebook takes the risk of having something published in its platform, it's liable for it in the same way as every newspaper is. Yeah, from my perspective, Neville, yeah. I, I would see it as a kind of a, a yes and no answer. In, in terms of the, the yes side of things, um, I think there is room for a bit of clarity on the innocent publication defense in particular, uh, insofar as it applies to the, the, the kind of social media companies that, um, that Owen mentioned. You know, um, we, we've all read the Moema decision, and I think that leaves a few questions unanswered as regards the applicability of that defense. So we can't change the, the EU law, hosting defense and e-commerce regs, et cetera. But I think some clarity on the precise scope of the innocent publication defense and the extent to which it applies to uh, social media companies would be helpful. But other than that, um, you know, the law allows the, the judge or the jury, whichever ends up making the decision, to take into account the sphere of publication, the seriousness of the allegation and the context in which it was made. So I think there's sufficient flexibility there built into the system for um, without making, without treating, say, internet publication differently in any other sense. That, that, that's, that's, that's my take on it. There is the argument, though, and I agree with you on that, uh, in terms of possibly characterizing social media uh, platforms as potentially benefiting from the defense of innocent publication, but which would require them, in effect, to take down any publication where there is a reasonable basis for assuming it was defamatory. But the difficulty, it seems to me, is that there's so much anonymous posting uh, on Twitter, so much kind of fake, face, <clears throat> face, uh, fake Facebook pages and so forth and so on, that even if an arch pharmacal order is got, it can be extremely difficult to activate this and take years, back to your time point, Keenan, take years to find an appropriate defendant. And the appropriate defendant uh, may simply not be a mark for damages anyway. So would it be appropriate for just simply for Twitter or uh, Facebook or whatever to be characterized as the appropriate defendant in these cases? I think uh, I, I, what, what I would do to address that issue, because I, I think the timing point is really important. You made the point earlier on, Neville, that, you know, part of defamation isn't just to compensate the plaintiff, it's to kind of vindicate them in, in a different sense. I think there is definitely scope to streamline our Norwich Pharmacal process. And there was a proposal, you guys might've seen this in the, the draft harassment legislation, there was a proposal to allow Norwich Pharmacal orders to go via the circuit court. That seemed to drop out um, um, late in the day, as it were. I think that was a shame. Maybe it'll reappear elsewhere, but I think that was a shame because I think those kind of applications or a lot of them certainly could go via the circuit court, try and speed that up. So I, I do see some potential for reform there, but Owen, I, I don't know what you think. Yep, I mean, it's a, it's a real feature of life um, in practice that something is published on social media and you have no idea who published it. And it's um, unattractive or difficult to sue Twitter or Facebook. Um, very often because um, they can say correctly that they didn't know it was defamatory when it went up and they've acted to take it down once they did. Um, and it's even indeed when you do get an Irish pharmacal order, even then it can be extremely difficult to work out uh, who's there. So maybe you're right, maybe some streamlining of that, some perhaps an obligation on social media enterprises to have better connection with their customers so that they're able to tell you in truth who their customers are easily. Mm -hmm. um, which it's... isn't just an Irish reform, it would be a sort of Europe-wide reform. But that sort of thing would at least enable plaintiffs to get to the people who have defamed them. Yeah, I, I'm, I have to come Sorry. running out of time. Um, we're, but, uh, we're running out of time, so I have lots of questions here, some of which are not fit for publication, I have, <laughs> right? But here are some of them and see what, what you think of them. 
About juries, that somebody asks, would it not be enough to amend the manner in which the judge directs the jury to meet some of the complaints about them? Or maybe I'll start on that. I mean, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was done in the 2009 Act. So now the judge has to give the jury directions about quantum and counsel can. The, the, the problem, I think, is a sort of a difficulty of working out exactly what those directions are. So the judges have traditionally been afraid to suggest figures um, right. because the, the figures at appellate levels are so variable. And counsel, I think, have engaged in staying off the same area precisely because they know that whatever figure the plaintiff gives can be matched by an equal but opposite figure by the defendant. And we've ended up in a position in which we give largely anodyne directions. Now, Keenan points out correctly that in some more recent cases, there have been more cogent directions. Um, and, and maybe that's a way forward. Yeah. So the next person asks, could, uh, flowing from the Higgins case, I don't know anything about this now, but anyway, have you any view on the reform of the offer to make the amends procedure? Should the percentage reduction of the award be determined by the jury? particularly when the Court of Appeal did not overturn the percentage reduction in Higgins. Were you in Higgins, Owen? I wasn't, but Keenan was, so he can Were you so Keenan, you yeah. can tell us that. I then. was, yeah, thank you. No, I agree with the, with the question. I, I think the law should be changed um, when, the, when there, there's an obvious opportunity for reform there. Um, in the Higgins case, we fought an application all the way to the Supreme Court and lost to try and convince the, the, the court that um, um, the amount of damages should be determined by a judge, not a jury where an offer of amends has been accepted. We lost because uh, in essence, the, the defamation legislation uses the word court and uh, the, the, the Supreme Court therefore had to determine whether court meant judge or jury. And it determined in the circumstances that it meant jury for various reasons. Um, I think that's an obvious, I think the offer of amends is a good idea. And I think it could work but I think the Higgins case has effectively killed it for now because no one's going to no one's going to bother with it when you, you end up before a jury anyways, like in the Higgins case for seven days. So um, so I think it's an obvious it's an obvious and very easy amendment to make or reform to make, and I think it should be near enough the top of the list of the government's priorities in that regard. I, I'm sure. I think I'm sure. Error, I think it was just an error. Uh, on the part of the legislation. So th this is a statutory procedure which was borrowed from England, whereby if you make an offer of, uh, to make, a, it's termed an offer of amends, uh, it has to be accepted effectively by the plaintiff because it's a complete defense if it isn't. And you offer to make amends if it, the amount that you offer is accepted, it's decided um, by the court and then can be discounted in percentage terms depending on your behavior and the nature of your offer and so forth. And in England, this has always been, been made explicit that it would be the judge sitting alone who would decide the amount. So you got, if you're a plaintiff, I'm sorry, if you're a defendant, you got that benefit that the quantum was going to be decided by a judge and then it would be discounted in percentage terms. I'd be fairly convinced that the Irish legislature, legislature intended the same thing to happen in Ireland, but used the term court rather than judge. And uh, I think I completely agree with Keenan Higgins has killed this off. And it's a very, potentially very useful defense. And so that, very important reform. Yeah, I agree with that too. Yeah. The next questioner wants to know, should you have three levels of courts for defamation cases, good, medium and bad, as it were? And would that weed out disingenuous claimants seeking large pay pay payouts? Well, Where's the bad level? Do you do that? Huh? Where's the bad level? Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so the suggestion is, is like this. Could, yeah. could they be taken in the district court, I think? Isn't that right? Yeah, yes, district court cases. Maybe, well, there isn't any district court jurisdiction, so maybe, yeah, maybe you could have, you could introduce a district court jurisdiction for very small cases. Yeah, yeah. So one of the, one of the disappointing what? things, actually, I think about the way in which the Defamation Act has worked is that there was this possibility for applying for declaratory relief from the circuit court, which I think could have been really useful, but the way it's been interpreted by the courts, it's it's been made, I think, pretty just virtually impossible really to reach the standard to obtain declaratory relief and i'd like to see that amended as well actually just so that it's clarified yeah i, th I think that's a good point Neville, because that issue has come up in my practice uh, I, I won't say regularly but a few times where you know i'm acting for plaintiffs 
who aren't particularly concerned about the damages uh, would rather get a, a relatively fast award um, and we're actively considering that kind of an application um, but you know due to this fact that you know it's a very high bar and if you don't meet it that's the end of your case you know it just seems to have put everybody off a bit like the offer of amends that one was kind of I think um, done before it even got up and running as it were because I don't think it was availed of much and hasn't really got anywhere but um, but I've also had clients who just back to the, the, the original question I have had clients who have considered taking cases in the circuit court for particular reasons mainly to avoid a jury um, just because of their, their particular profile etc and the speed at which they might get an award and they were quite happy for the damages to be capped etc so um, there, there are sometimes interesting decisions and interesting conversations with clients about where is the most appropriate for to take your case and uh, what remedies should you be considering. Okay, we've lots and lots of questions, so we'll, we'll have to get short answers. This one says, following the comments of the European Commission for Justice DDA Rayners in relation to the chilling effect on investigative journalism, what would the panel's opinion be on the introduction of anti-slap legislation, strategic law school suits against public participation. I never heard of it. Anyway, what do you think about that, Owen? We'll start with you, short answer from each. I'm not sure um, what anti-slap legislation is, I have to yeah. say. So I'm going to be um, disadvantaged in answering the question. Right. But um, if we mean some form of test like Sullivan and New York Times, um, whereby you have to prove malice against public figures. Mm. Um, I, I don't think we're going to introduce that. And I think, personally, I think it's too high a bar for our plaintiffs to meet. Right. Uh, do, you, do you know about this, Keenan, this anti-slap uh, legislation? I, I would have answered that, that, that question in the exact same way Owen just did. I, I agree with yeah. him 100% about what he said. Um, and right. I, I don't think there should be... Uh, a malice uh, requirement for uh, for public figures just by virtue of the fact they are public figures again. Right. Okay, next question. It's clear from the case law that juries can get the evaluation of damages wrong and usually by overestimation. But are juries able to determine the correct type of damages if not the amount of damages? Uh, what do you think of that, Keenan? Um. <laughs> You were in the Higgins case that they referred I, I, to. I would, I would rather that they didn't have any role in assessing damage. I, I don't think there's many people who are, 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 who are now making the argument that they're effective at assessing damage. I think most of the arguments are in the, the territory now where, where, where Owen is, which is that they are effective in, um, in determining whether something is defamatory, but need some sort of support or else just need to be taken out of the, the damages routine. So I, I would, or the damages equation, so I would just... Uh, take them out completely from the assessment of damages. That would be my proposed solution. Yeah. Many years yeah. ago, there was a system of advisory advisory awards where a jury could um, suggest a figure, and then it was up to the judge to whether accept it to accept it or not. So maybe that's what the questioner has in mind that the jury could say, "Here's what we think is right," but it's up to you. This question, um, would any of the panelists be in favor of introducing a form of preliminary assessment to ascertain whether the defamatory comment has been made, such as in PIAB, and get damages after a determination? Would this take the cases out of court and possibly reduce costs? Well, um... I'll have, a, I'll have a go at that one. I think that that to some extent goes back to our offer of amends because I think where PIAB really have a useful role in a personal injuries context, I'm not a personal injuries lawyer, but I understand it to be the case that they come into their own, as it were, where liability is admitted and they're just dealing with the assessment of the, of the, the quantum or the, the amount of damages. And I think the kind of reforms we discussed earlier on, such as re-energizing um, the offer of amends would be a step in the right direction in that regard, whereby you would have these cases where liability is admitted and then you can get into a more fast track assessment of damages. So the whole process, the route to vindication um, and the time for vindication is much quicker, much more efficient and to quote Owen or you're on more predictable. Right. And uh, Neville, you answered this one to me. No, 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 actually they asked that it should be you Keenan. 
uh, would you, they'd like to ask you whether you believe that judges are adequately positioned to consider themselves the eyes of reasonable members of society? Or can judges be considered reasonable as, a, as opposed to, quote, slightly removed and considerably well-educated, unquote, members of society? Yeah. I, I think of, of all the arguments for retaining the jury, and particularly that aspect of the jury, I think that is the most powerful argument. Um, um, Owen obviously referenced it earlier on, but I had referenced it in the, in the piece I wrote on this issue as well. I, I do see that, that you know, um, I do see the argument that 12 ordinary people might be better assessed, better in a better position to assess that issue than, as the, as the, the, uh, the questioner suggested, maybe a well-educated judge from a particular background or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, but the reason I would get rid of them in, in total is I think you have to look at it in the round and what defamation law is, it, is trying to achieve. I think it has to be fast or relatively fast. I think it has to be accessible. Um, and um, I think if you look at all the other countries where there are no juries, they seem to get by okay with allowing these judges make those decisions. And perhaps a specialist judge over time, like our judge is in, in effect has become, would gain the, the necessary skills as well. So. Um, although I, that's the that's the issue I would uh, kind of um, be most uneasy about, I would still, on balance, um, suggest getting rid of them because I think the the the, the, the pros as a whole um, outweigh the cons. Yeah, and the final question I want to ask is: Do you do does the panel think that politicians should have the same protection as everybody else uh, in by defamation law? I'll come in on that. Um, it depends what we're talking about, in my view. So if we're talking about public business of politicians in terms of um, their public lives and, and the work they do, uh, I think absolutely not. I think that there is there is a need for a heightened protection for public interest journalism, uh, but which would be purely for public interest journalism, <clears throat> rather than for sort of social media chatter. Um, and I think you know, the European Court of Human Rights is quite clear in this, that politicians and public figures, public officials by virtue of their work must be subjected to uh, a high standard of investigative journalism. I would be far more concerned with the idea of the private lives of politicians and of public figures being a uh, fair game for, for reporting. Uh, because it seems to me that it's not a matter of public interest. Yes. What would you think, Owen? I, I, I agree completely with that. That's the, um, Neville describes the defence that Section 26 of the 2009 Act, Fair and Reasonable Publication, is meant to provide. Um, and uh, for a piece of serious public interest journalism written on the subject of public interest, there is in principle a defence. Mind you, it just so happens it's never been successfully run in Ireland. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think uh, politicians uh, should get the d degree of protection they seem to get, particularly when scandals are, are being investigated. What would you think, Keenan? I agree with Neville entirely, um, mm. and and I think I think they're spot on. Yes. Well, that's the end of the questions we've had. So I will now hand you back to uh, Gareth after I've thanked our panelists for this very interesting discussion and thank you for participating with us. And it's been a really good evening. Thank you so much, all of you. Gareth, you take. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, sincere thanks to our speakers, to O McCullough, Senior Counsel, to Keen Furlong from Inal Goodbody and to our own Trinity professors, Neville Cox and Yvonne Scannell. But particularly thank you to all of you who decided to join us this evening for this important series. I hope you'll join us next week for the third uh, week of our four week series. And next week we will, we will have the gig economy, a conversation between Trinity professor Desmond Ryan and Nuala Clayton of William Fry. So once again, thank you so much for joining us and have a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>